What's up everybody, Mitch here from 45 Drives, and as you can see, we've got a new face here today. Hey guys, I'm Sean, and I'm a data storage specialist with 45 Drives. And today, what we're gonna be talking about is Plex servers on the HL15. We did some really cool testing, so stay tuned. All right guys, so before we dive into the actual testing and everything that we did here, I wanna give a little bit of background of what Plex is replacing or where Plex is gonna fit into the ecosystem of what we're talking about here. So I imagine you guys are very well aware and probably most of you use some of these streaming services that exist right now. Uh, we're talking about Amazon Prime, Netflix, Hulu, the list goes on. You could close your eyes and throw a rock and I'm sure you'd find a streaming service out there. So with all of those streaming services that we have, you can imagine that for someone that wants to watch specific things or have specific uh, tastes in mind, they may have to take three, four, five streaming services to really get that fully featured experience that they want with all the movies and shows that they may want to watch. Actually, I mean, I know myself, I have Netflix, I have uh, Amazon Prime Video, and really that's the only ones that I partake in because I also run a Plex server. But what about you, Sean? What, what services do you use? Yeah, I use Netflix, Disney Plus. Disney Plus, okay. Amazon Prime. Amazon Prime as well. So yeah. They do yeah, add up. Most people have at least two or more, right? Like it's, it's a very common theme. So what is Plex doing then in this ecosystem? What does it replace or what does it do? So um, as what is a common theme here at 45 Drives and especially 45 Home Lab is a do-it-yourself approach or a self-hosted approach. So what Plex allows us to do is to take all of our favorite media that we enjoy and put it in a self-hosted manner and build your own media streaming services. And what's really cool about all this is the Plex part of it will take all the metadata, all the actors' names, the description of the movies, even posters, and put it in a really nice app with a really nice coat of paint. Whereas if you start hosting this and you give it out to your users, it's almost like a professional streaming service at this point. And I guarantee you'll get a lot of brownie points with friends and family if you start sharing it out because they're gonna think that you're a technology wizard with how amazing it runs, right? So all you have to do is host the media itself and then upload it to the server. Uh, so I know you set up a Plex server for us here over the last a uh, couple weeks and you've been doing some testing for us. Uh, so what have you done? Did you, were you running the testing just on the HL15? Yeah, correct. Okay, cool. So I, I guess, have you done 1080p, 4K, that kind of stuff? Yeah, so I did, uh, I did some uh, 4K streams. Yep. I also did some 1080p. Okay. And I also did some transcoding from ah, okay. 4K down to 1080p. Okay, so that's a great point. So transcoding, let's talk a little bit about what streaming versus transcoding is, uh, just so everyone can kind of understand what, we're, what we mean here. So as you guys know, the HL15 is a purpose-built storage server, right? But we put enough compute into this thing to be able to do a lot of other really cool things as well. So anyone that has used Plex before may be familiar with something called Intel QuickSync. So Intel on their CPUs have typically uh, a graphics card or a GPU, it's not a graphics card, but they're pretty powerful these days, especially for media playback. And so if you had a consumer grade i7, i5, things like that, you can get a lot of transcoding. And what transcoding is, is it's the ability to take a 4K video and downsize it to let's say 1080p or 720p. Now why would you want to do something like that? Well think about if you have users that are you know uh, in your neighborhood or, or in your city that want to use your Plex service and they only have 10 megabit internet or 20 megabit internet or even maybe they have better internet but they've got a lot of people using it. What you can do is if they start streaming that video uh, from your Plex server to their house and it's, let's say, a 4K video. Well, that's very data intensive, right? And that can use up a lot of your internet speed. So what we can do with a Plex server using transcoding is on the fly, we can have the server downsize that from a 4K video to 1080p. And of course, you're gonna sacrifice a little bit of image quality, but 1080p is still fantastic, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so what's really cool about that is it's all happening in real time on your server. And so one of the big tests that we did here was to see out of the box, a HL15 that is, again, not fully designed as this, what can we get out of it? And we were actually 
pretty surprised, right? Uh, not only with the streams, but a little bit of the transcoding. Yeah. So maybe tell us a little bit about how many 1080p streams simultaneously you were able to do off of the six core Xeon CPU here. Again, with no onboard graphics whatsoever, just the six cores. Yeah, so we were able to actually get seven, pull seven streams out of that. Okay, so seven 1080p streams and you were seeing the CPU start to, to hit its limit yeah, there. Yeah. Okay, so what about transcoding? I know we did some transcoding of 1080p down to like 720p and I think that was around three that you could transcode there, right? Yeah, correct. Okay, so you know, that doesn't sound like a ton and, and it isn't a ton, right? But the reason for that is because again, there's no onboard graphics with this thing. Um, so, but that is actually some pretty good results. But what we also did after the fact is we put a graphics card in here and not a very expensive graphics card at all, right? We, I think it was an A5000, which I think you can get P for like- P2000. P2000, okay. thank you. No, oh, this guy's on the wall. I think you can uh, get those for like 300, 200 US, uh, something like that, and maybe even a better deal on, on eBay these days. So tell us a little bit about how much that upped our Plex game when we put in a graphics card. So how many 1080p uh, streams or 4K streams did we get? Well. This is actually a really exciting number. We were able to get 24 streams. That was actually, yeah, that was transcoding, not streams. So when we say streams, we, we mean 1080p direct back to 1080p, which is pretty easy to do, right? That's, that's, that's uh, a lot less difficult. But you were able to get 24 1080p to 720p transcodes, which is actually really impressive. Um, and that is just by using hardware acceleration. Now, full disclosure on all of that, you do need a graphics card and a uh, Plex subscription pass. Um, Plex does have the ability to do hardware uh, encoding, which is what allows this, uh, but you need to do it with a Plex patch, which I think is, what was that? It's like uh, 60 bucks a year or something like that? Uh, I knew it was around $6 a month. $6 a month, yeah. So I think you can save uh, a little bit if you go and, and buy for the year, something like that. Okay, so we did 24, transcodes from 1080p to 720 how many 4k because 4k is it sounds you know 4k doesn't seem like it's a big jump from 1080p but it really is it's a massive jump in how much compute it uses and how much bandwidth it uses also so going from 4k to 1080p how many could we get so we were able to pull seven streams from 4k down to 1080p wow that's actually not bad at all and i'll tell you how i know that so my Plex server at home, I run an Intel i9-9900K, uh, and I've got a GTX 1080. So a few years old now at this point, but that was a high-end GPU six, seven years ago, I think. Uh, the time flies around here. But I can't get seven 4K streams to 1080p without really seeing my server chug. So that's actually pretty cool to be able to see something like that. Okay, so we talked about some really cool things, uh, kind of the results that we got. Let's talk a little bit about the methodology so you guys can get a, a kind of peek behind the curtain of, of how this testing was done. So I know you were using a pretty powerful client um, to run all these tests on. I think that was an Intel i9-11900K, right? Yeah, that's yeah? right. Yeah, okay, and I, well, how much RAM did the client have? Uh, I believe it was 32 gigs. 32 gigs of RAM, okay. So let's talk about how you ran the test. How were we able to test how many possible streams the Plex server was going? Was this done on multiple machines or did you do this from a single machine? So I just did it from a single machine. Okay. Um, I had a command line just overwatching all the results. Mm -hmm. And then I had a browser and I just opened up multiple tabs, multiple tabs okay. and just monitored that until we basically couldn't go anymore. Maxed out. And so when you were maxing out then, I guess the, the obvious thing that you would do is check your client's CPU utilization, RAM utilization, graphics utilization to make sure that it wasn't the bottleneck that was we were coming up against, correct? Yeah, yeah. that's right. Okay, cool. So, and then also, since we're on a gigabit connection, we had tons of bandwidth left available to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so that's actually a good point when we, when we say this. So seven streams, right? Not a lot of bandwidth, especially at 1080p. So what I want to hit here and is very important is the bottleneck that we're coming in obviously wasn't from the hard drives themselves. Actually, in fact, you could do those seven 1080p streams simultaneously and still be reading and writing it over a gigabyte a second on a whole different use case if you wanted to without any issues whatsoever. Uh, so the bottleneck here in this case is that it was a the CPU bottleneck, right? And I think this is a, a great segue into talking about the HL15 itself as a Plex media server and kind of uh, where we see this as. So 15 bays, right? So 15 bays. So a Plex server, believe it or not, like I have one at home, uh, it can eat up a lot of space pretty quickly, especially if you're doing 4K rips. Um, you know, you, you can definitely eat a lot of space. Now that's not to say you're not going to have a, a whole lot of movies and TV shows with that. I've got, I think, something like 
15,000 episodes and like 3,000 movies on mine. Um, but, so that being said, with this 15 bays, we can go up to 360 terabytes. I believe that's raw, something like that. Uh, and then, so obviously you want to put a little bit of parity uh, in there as well to, to uh, save yourself in, in the event of a drive failure so you don't actually lose your media. Um, so, when we talk about the HL15 as a Plex PNA server, obviously the pre-built version did pretty good, right? With the addition of uh, one pretty cheap graphics card, we were able to get a really respectable home media server that could serve up to 24 clients doing 1080p transcodes and probably actually definitely much higher doing direct streams, right? And so that's all up to you to decide on how you want your clients to do it. But when we sought out to build 45 Home Lab and the HL15, we wanted choice to be a big, big factor. So we wanted our customers and our users to have the choice to put what they wanted into it. And so we know we have a lot of uh, customers out there rocking the HL15 with a whole lot beefier uh, system than, than the six core Xeon in here. And so if you were to, let's say, want to build a very high-end Plex Media server for many friends and family, well, you have the option to buy the chassis without the electronics, and then you can put your, uh, God knows what you guys have in them, maybe up to 64 core AMD Epic CPUs, I would guess. Uh, I know a few people have, have shown off some pretty beefy uh, home uh, HL15 servers, and I'm one of them. I've got like 32 cores in mine at home too, so uh, I'm part of that club. Um, but with that being said, I mean, I think that hits on a lot of uh, the, the really cool value proposition of the HL15 as a Plex server. Um, one last thing that I wanted to talk about is, you know, talking about how do we get media and what, what is the, the way that we do this, right? Because you think all these streaming services are great, they're convenient, they add up in price, right? Obviously, uh, very quickly. You know, you imagine you're paying for these, uh, these services and with, from month to month, you're probably not consuming 98% plus of what's on the platform. So you're paying for such a small subset of what you're watching when it's convenient to you. And so if you think of it that way, what would be a better way if you wanted to take the initiative to go in? Well, there's a few ways to do it, obviously. Uh, we're not going to go into one of the big ways that, that people build their and manage their Plex servers, of course. But the, the way in which I, of course, do it mine is uh, I've been purchasing Blu-rays, DVDs, and 4K Blu-rays for as long as I can remember. I've been collecting uh, uh, literally since I think I was about 15, 16. And so it was a no-brainer for me. Uh, how have I watched my movies and shows over the last few years? I would go up to my giant shelf and I would pull one down, put it in the Blu-ray player and watch it. And, you know, that gets annoying after a while. I right? don't miss those days. No, exactly. And, and if you want to share them to friends and family, you share it out. And how often do you get those back? No. <laughs> Never. Probably, Never. probably not too often, right? So, I mean, I think that's a common theme that everyone knows about. And so what you can do is just with a not very powerful desktop at all, or even maybe using your HL15 as double duty, you can take your DVDs and your Blu-rays and you can rip them and then put them into a format that is great for Plex. And then you can share out your movies and your TV shows all day to your friends and family and never have to worry about getting angry at them because they, they didn't return them in time or ever. <clears throat> All right, so I think we covered a whole lot. Uh, we talked about and explained, I think, why Plex is such an intriguing proposition uh, these days with the state of, of the media world. Uh, but the last thing I kind of want to leave you with is this, right? Um, if we think about the ecosystem of the streaming world right now or purchasing your media on digital platforms, we say purchasing as if you think it's yours, right? But at the end of the day, what we're doing is buying licenses or buying or monthly subscription services. So at the end of the day, what you're buying isn't really yours, right? And so I think gamers know this more than anyone. If you think back just a couple of years ago to Google Stadia, uh, I don't know if you used it or not, but I, I partook in it and tried it out. It was a cloud gaming service, right? And people started buying their games on there and it wasn't longer than I think about a year that they shut down uh, their services. And so that's the end of that. There goes your digital purchases. Uh, and and the, you know, media and TV is definitely far from immune for that, from that. Um, we see on, on Netflix and on Amazon Prime, all these other ones, things go away very, very regularly, right? You have your favorite movie that's on there and then you get a notification that it's leaving in a month, right? And so what do you do now? Well, you have to go find another streaming service that might have it. And so what Plex does as a proposition is make sure that you never get that rug pull, right? Where your movies and your shows are your own and once you have them, they're safe and you'll never lose them again in a much more convenient way than just having the DVD or the Blu-ray, which is the same type of proposition, but this just makes it uh, much more easy to manage uh, from, a, from a user's perspective.
said. So yeah, with that said, um, I'm really excited to have Sean here today. It's his first video, so um, he'll be on many more to come, I hope, I'm sure. Yeah, th uh, thanks for, thanks for uh, letting me be here and letting me join in. I appreciate it. Happy to have you. Can't wait to see what, uh, what testing you do next for us. Cool. All thanks, right. Man. Thanks, everybody.